It is October 17th, 1997. I'm Jeff Kisseloff, here with Rod Erickson, who has gotten all dressed up today for the Archive of American Television. And we're in Pound Ridge, New York. Just to get started, Rod, your full name and the date of your date of birth? Rodney Erickson, July 9th, 1916. And, uh, and where was that? Where Chicago. Was Chicago, Illinois. Were you raised there? Up until uh, high end of high school, then we moved to St. Joseph, Missouri, which I consider my home. W what did your dad do? He was an, a, 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 uh, an engineer, a civil engineer. And you had a great love for theater when you were younger. Do you know where it came from? My mother was a pusher. A drug pusher? No, not a drug pusher, a child pusher. Uh-huh. Which was? What's a pusher? I had to go to dancing school, elocution, play the piano, wow. and she booked me. As a matter of fact, later in life when I was in New York, unknown, unbeknownst to me, she called Dr. IQ and told him she had a brilliant son who was a writer in New York. And uh, they put me on, and I won first prize of $25. <laughs> so she was a real stage mother. Never stopped. Why? Where did that come from? She didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> but did she love theater? Did your parents no. love theater? My father was my father sang semi-professionally uh -huh. as a second tenor. Uh huh. So there was some of that theatrical background. Some. Did they take you to see theater when you were growing up? No, I went myself. Really? When I was about twelve years old, I went to the opera, for example, bought my own ticket, and went this the L to see uh, Pag and Pag and uh, Bag. Well, twelve years old. Yeah. What else would you see? Well, I saw almost anything you get in for free. Mm -hmm. Did you sneak in? or? Uh... No, I didn't sneak in. But if, if you wait for the uh, intermission, you just walk in with everybody else. Did you have favorite shows that you saw? For musicals or drama? I like the opera very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was the last year of high school, we produced a... Rip Van Winkle, I was the director of WCFL in Chicago. That was my first radio, 1933. Now, when you, where did you go to college? Uh, when we moved to St. Joe, this is desperately poor times, remember. Mm -hmm. I, I went to the St. Joseph Junior College, which was free, and I could walk to school and it was for two years. And I must say, I don't think any teacher got over $2,500 a year, and it was one of the finest bits of education I ever had. For example, in our social psychology class, there were 20 of us. Five became doctors of psychology. Wow. That's teaching. Mm -hmm. wow. You said it was desperately poor times. Was it particularly difficult on your dad? Yes. He couldn't support his I supported the family for a year Do after we, high school, working in as an apprentice auditor in the northern trust company bank, a deluxe bank in Chicago. And I must say that that made me smarter than most of the people I've worked with the rest of my life about money. Must have been tough on your dad though. Broke his heart, died young. You went to St. Joe's for two years? Yes, AA, I've got an AA from there. And where did you go from there? University of Iowa. Which was a big move for the family, wasn't it? For you to move uh, away from I moved. You moved. Yeah. Was it tough on your family to move away from home like that? No. no. <laughs> Did you study theater there? I have a degree in dramatic art. Uh -huh. the, the University of Iowa is one of the best equipped schools in the country, and I've visited many of them since then. We had a student-operated radio station. I had a half-hour radio show to, to direct and produce every week, and one of my writers was Tennessee Williams. Uh, we, had, we invented theater in the round. At least I'd never heard of anybody else doing it. We had a Shakespearean theater done with boxes, the Russian style. We just moved the boxes, but recited all the lines. We had six major, show, major shows, like Clive of India, Henry IV, Part I, John Gabriel Bjorkman, the Ibsen play, and a couple of contemporary ones, which were subscribed to by all the faculty and, and affluent people in Iowa City. And uh, I, I played 18 parts in a year and a half. Wow. 
sometimes the lead, sometimes a small part, sometimes I was the stage manager, sometimes I did the lighting, always did the painting of sets, wow. sewed up the cyclorama when it was broken, everything. Great training. Now this is 1936, so how did you pay for the school? I worked uh, nights in a cereal factory in St. Joe, in seven days a week for 40 cents an hour, a midnight shift. In a cereal factory? Yeah. Do One time the sprinklers went off. That's the heat of the place. Wow. What did you do in the cereal factory? So I, I had a big job. Uh, there was an endless belt where wheat flakes came by me, and if I saw rats or, or hardware or burnt things, I stopped the belt and pushed it off with a broom. And that was your job? Oh, yes, very important. Otherwise, you wouldn't want to eat that cereal. <laughs> <laughs> Who, what, was the, um, what was the company? North... North Northern Cereal. Uh -huh. By the way, it rarely put out in its own name. That's where I learned about brand, uh, private brands. Uh -huh. The same cereal would be uh, sold under a different brand at 26 different names with 26 different prices. Uh -huh. So this was not Post or Nabisco? No, no. But it, well, the volume was high, uh -huh. but it did not have its own brand name. I've rarely put anything out in its own brand. So you said Tennessee Williams is one of your writers. Yeah. What, well, it was any, Thomas Lanier Williams in those days. Did he have any potential, do you think? Well, I thought there were two better writers. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, what about Tennessee? Was he any good? Oh, or yes. Oh, there's no question he was good. His problem is he never had a uh, beginning or an end in the stuff I did. He always had an excerpt. It's a character study, basically. Now, when did you decide to come to New York? Always. Really? Always knew I was coming to New York. How did you come here? Hitchhiked from Iowa. Five dollars in my pocket. And where did you settle down? Well, we, a bunch of the, uh, of the graduates of the drama, drama school at Iowa had a small place at 55th Street, 4 West 55th Street, which was a good location. Had fleas in the bed and stuff, but it was a good location. And uh, I lived in a dollar a day for a year. On a dollar a day? Yes. Including food? Everything. Uh, Clothes. Well. <laughs> books. <laughs> and, and where were you working? Where were you trying to work? Where, where you got every any kind of a job you can. The, the most important job. I, was, I went there to become an apprentice for CBS. I had an, I had an uh, offer to be interviewed, and they only took six, and I think there were 12. And somebody beat me out who went to Paley School, Pennsylvania. Oh. But, and when I... In the interval where they were apprenticing and I was doing odd jobs, in the end of about two years they got promoted and I got in there exactly the same time as if I had been an apprentice in the CBS production department. Mm -hmm. wow. So in the meantime, what were you doing? A lot. Uh, most of, one of the strange things you do when you're young and you're trying, very few people have ever heard W.H. Auden and Christopher Isherwood's play The Ascent of F6. Mm -hmm. About seven of us put that on in a village, and it was called, I would say it was off, off, off Broadway. But critics came, and they, the two authors worked with us on this. This was what? This was an allegory. F6 is a mountain. Uh -huh. It was the adventures of seven people climbing it. 1938, you would say? 39. How long did the play last? One performance. <laughs> but it was fun to do. Oh. You didn't care. Nobody asked how much you were going to get. Nobody cared whether you get. It was experience. Do you remember where you put it on? Yeah, in a in a uh, duplex on East 18th Street, just off Fifth Avenue. Hmm. The audience sat at the bottom. We worked the stairs. That was the mountain. Wow. <laughs> now, how long did you stay in New York that first trip? Into first time, about a year. About a year. And what? Why did you decide to leave? Well, I had a little love affair going that pushed me back west. Did you go down to Washington at some point? Yes, or? after that. After that? About, or in the fall when I got back, I was ended up back in St. Joe. Well, I was doing jobs in St. Joe, too. There was there were drama. Believe it or not, there were drama series every place I went, so I was always acting or something. Did you try to, when you first trip into the city, did you try to get into radio? Everything. Tried everything. Doing what? Would you go to auditions for radio? Oh, or? yes. A lot of auditions. Uh -huh. any, any success? A lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get a job as a page at NBC because I wasn't tall enough. I, I could have gotten it, but I, I couldn't get uh, up to the, the, the ladder they put over your head. Wow. 
The uniform wouldn't fit. Wow. Ray Forrest, was he's about your height. Maybe he's a little bit taller than you. He probably had heels in. <laughs> so you went down to Washington. What was the job that you had down in Washington? I was in charge of network production from for the Blue Network. Which meant what? Mostly it meant putting on political, but we did a lot of local stuff. There were two stations. NBC owned two stations in Washington, WRC and WMAL. One was the Red Network and the other was the Blue Network. WMAL is where I worked, so I did a lot of local stuff, quizzes, everything. Just for somebody who doesn't know, explain the, the Red and Blue Network. NBC, for a very short period of time, was allowed by the FCC to own two networks. One was called the Red, one was the Blue, then there was CBS, and very little else. So NBC had a monopoly on radio network at that point, to a certain degree. But there was a difference in the type of programming between the Red and the Blue, wasn't there? Not basically. Was it one more profitable and one was more, the Red was more commercial? Red was, more, Red was a more important, it, had, it did have the more important show. There was one thing I did come out of uh, Washington with. I wrote, directed, got on the air, a thing for the Secret Service called Know Your Money. Well, first it taught me never to get a bum bill. Second, it, I, I get to, got to know all the Secret Service guys, and I had a lot of stories out of them. Wow. Now, was it there that you met Arthur Godfrey? Yes, Arthur Godfrey and I were both fired from WRC, WMAL. Um, later, later, by the way, the, the, a wonderful guy who is the head of uh, Vice President of NBC for Washington said, we made two terrible mistakes in our life, you and Arthur Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Arthur. Arthur was a little difficult. Ar right? Arthur was crazy. Uh -huh. In what way? Well, first place, he was, no one did anything the way Arthur Godfrey did it. Mm -hmm. He would insult the client. Remember, he, we had a client with a white, dirty white bear outside of his shop. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, go by and kick the bear and go in and tell Ike that Arthur sent you. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, everybody kicked the bear, and everybody went in the store sooner or later to buy whatever the store sold. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was outrageous. He was that's very, probably why NBC fired him. Or, was, that's why they fired me, too. He was very effective, though. I mean, he got all the... Oh, people very. People he moved store. right away to CBS affiliate. And, uh, but but he, he, still had, he still had ties to NBC. He'd come there to make recordings when he was making a recording. But you also had other problems with him, right? You wouldn't get on the air at time? Oh, that was later when I went and moved to CBS and I was a production man. Mm -hmm. And they knew I had met him in Washington. So he had a show from 6.30 to 8. The hardest trouble I had was getting him into the studio by 6.30. Mm -hmm. He happened to like hookers. And one time he, he had a party with three hookers and told the management of the Lexington Hotel where he stayed that he was not to be disturbed. Well, at 6.15 I called and they said, we won't put you through to Mr. Godfrey. And they refused, he, he bullied them. And uh, I was ready to uh, walk over to the Lexington, but I couldn't make it in 15 minutes. So the only thing I remembered was that Arthur kept his radio on all the time to CBS. So at 6.30 I got in, gave the time, the weather, had a played a record and I said, Arthur, get up. And I said that three times and finally it got through the fog. And at 6.55 he came in and did all the commercials brilliantly so we didn't have to give any money back and went on with the show for another hour. The original Peck's bad boy. Oh, no, I'm not sure how originally was there a lot in history. <laughs> But he came across immediately, even in those early days, he was he Absolutely, really absolutely. Well, later, uh, later, Young and Ruby came where I was working in television, had the uh, talent scouts, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to go on it. I said, what for? You don't, if, you're, if you have any courage or any, any stamina, you don't get on with Arthur. Send a pretty girl with the commercial, that's enough. They'll take care of Arthur totally, and that's what they did. You had, to, you had to do that specifically, didn't you, with, with one girl? I have a vague recollection of a story where he was giving some trouble, he was causing some trouble, and you had to have some girl come out and do the commercial with him. No, she, she persuaded him. Mm -hmm. we, she was a good a very good copier. Her name was Sylvia Dowling. But she also uh, jollied him. She knew exactly how to jolly him. 
why, what was the secret of his success? I mean, oh, yeah, he we never had strong personalities. Almost all the early television shows were bland because there was no strong personality. It doesn't matter whether you like him, you don't like him, you, you could not ignore him. That's the secret of a great television personality. And that was Arthur. Arthur was the best. Mm -hmm. And as a salesman, he was best. On radio too in the early days? On radio too. Yeah. He had he very inventive, but he was down to earth. It wasn't any of the dialogue said, I, I like this, it's good for you, I'll eat it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Boom. He figured out, he used tea bags, for example, to, to lick stamps. Instead of your tongue, he used a tea bag. Okay. He'd be very inventive about a lot of things. And when, when he was off the mic on radio and off the camera on television, was he the same way? Or was... Yeah, pretty much so. Yeah. Well, remember, he buzzed the, he buzzed the tower at the airfield yeah. in New Jersey, and he had several automobile accidents that didn't come by accident. Right. But a big ego later on in television was it very a big, radio? very big ego. Yes, same thing. He never changed. Yeah, he was a big ego from the beginning, with some reason. Yeah, he was good. Yes, he was good. Why did the two of you get fired from the, from the radio station? Oh, well, he got fired because of what he said on the air. I got fired because I thought this was a dumb way. The big, big thing they wanted to do at that point, the manager of the station, Fred Sean was to develop girl singers with a little band. He was more interested in whether I knew where to place the microphone in front of a band than develop a personality or something like that. We had a complete different point of view. I didn't think they were worth anything. If you're, gonna, if you're in radio and you want a girl singer, you get a record of the best. You don't try to develop amateurs to do that job. It's boring and it takes no rating. Mm -hmm. So that's all. It was nothing. We liked each other. We got along fine. Where did you go from there? Best experience in to, to prepare me for television. I spent four months in a summer theater. Mm -hmm. And where? Hunterdon Hills Playhouse, Hunterdon County, New Jersey. And this was around 1940? 19... Early 40s? Like Something 40s? like that. Yeah, 40s, I think. Uh -huh. 1940. Uh, 1939-40, is that? 40. It was all one year. Right. It was from May until October. And why... Why was that so helpful? Well, I don't think if you haven't been spent a season in a summer stock company, you understand what life is like. I, I'm on the official program. I was called head of public relations. When I got there, they didn't have any lights. They didn't even have an electric line. They had an equity company, an equity director, and it was chaos. They had no knowledge whatsoever how to change a barn. It's like Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney saying, oh, there's a barn, let's have a show. Nothing. So I had, we had two people from the University of Iowa there who had done all this stuff. So we're climbing tall letters, and we're rigging the bridge lights, the beam lights, and uh, we're, we're rigging, we got, we, they had an old beat up McKinley type dimmer. We rigged that up, tried to put the salt water bucket down so you could dim the lights. It was primitive for an equity company, which is a very expensive way to run a summer stock. And after a while, I was playing the lead. We, I found out very quickly, too, you can put on all the fine shows you want, nobody's going to come, because it's a six-mile drive from the road to the playhouse and poorly marked. Mm -hmm. But when we put on White Cargo, where the lovely, lissom native girl seduces all the white guys and... and sends them out of the into the hospital everybody came <laughs> and we we put a picture of her in a costume on top of the station wagon drove it through all the local towns sold out all week long non-equity company another marketing lesson <laughs> of course wow. now, after that you went to cbs radio yeah, uh, I have to keep track of where I'm going. Right, was, everything was moving very rapidly. WHP radio. Oh, I went for, for I spent six months in WHP. Doing what? Well, some f friends of mine had, I had met in Washington had moved down there. It was a very big, a uh, big regional radio station, and the sales manager there wasn't getting any help from the manager and the program director. So I worked with him in developing shows for large clients like a department store. And I noticed reading some of my old notes that 
uh, I had put on a number of shows with amateur talent on the fifth floor of the department store, which means you have to look at all the merchandise to get up there, right. among other things. And it was quite successful. The paper wrote it all up. And about that time, CBS called. Okay. Well, matter of fact, I had a job in Orlando. If I had taken that job, I would have been very rich now in real estate, I'm sure. <laughs> but just at the point I was about to go to Orlando, CBS production called, and I joined them in March 1941, I think. Uh, I was 40, yeah. Okay. It was 41. 40, 41. Yeah. Uh, oh, that, no, that's right. It was 40, just 40. before Pearl Harbor. And um, so you were there for how long? Two years. Two years. And doing what? Well, first place, that's where I first met Dan Seymour, who became a very close friend of mine. I was, I was CBS representative. It's hard to under explain what a production man does. I, you keep the log for the FCC, for example. Mm -hmm. and you're assigned to shows. Some of the shows were agency directed. Mm -hmm. Aunt Jenny's True Life Stories for Lever Brothers was one. John Lubton was the director, but I, I helped him. I was assigned by, I worked for the network, but I helped him by timing the show and doing all kinds of details like that. But I was in charge of the studio. He was in charge of the show. Explain how a show could be agency directed, the system that was in operation in radio in those days. Almost universally. Mm -hmm. The agency and the client buys or owns or develops a show, Aunt Jenny's True Life Stories, case in point. Then they rehearse the show, cast it, and bring it to the studio. From that point on, they still do the show through airtime, but they, I represented CBS working with them to be sure. Well, it's, you partly censor them. You partly watch them to be sure they don't do anything wrong or set fire to the studio or anything. And that almost happened one time, by the way. <laughs> but but in, why would they set fire to a studio? You don't have to. No, it was, a, it was a joke. Dan, we did a repeat to the West Coast. The show went on 11.45 to 12 for the network. And then a repeat was a quarter of two to two to the West Coast. And the, the actors used to horse around at that time because it was... S same old thing, they were doing it again. Arlene Francis set fire to Danny Seymour's script while he was reading the commercial. <laughs> that, that seemed to be a regular... Uh, I just regular just thought it was very funny. <laughs> I, I think I banned her for life from that studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the point of um, the way the system operated was CBS would sell an hour or a half hour... Uh, a quarter hour in this... Price. Yes to an agency, and they right. could program that hour in any way they wanted. Well, not exactly. CBS had to approve it. They had to approve it. Yes, but, but then they, they their, their, hour, their quarter hour. But it was essentially their time. Yes. In other words. Now, you were there for two years, and you left to go to Port 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 Well, um, while I was there, uh, I was uh, made a director of a show called The Spirit of 41 and Into 42, where First Burgess Meredith, and then Rush Hughes, and I, and Brewster Morgan was the producer. All these were were big guys at the time, and uh, Willis Cooper was the writer, who was a cap, former captain in the cavalry. Yeah. Uh, we moved to the to, we well we were in Canada, we were in Georgia. All these shows were in remotes where we covered the preparedness of the United States and the preparedness of Canada for oh. war. Uh -huh. Before Pearl Harbor. Wow. So I directed those shows in a remote. Wow. The, the first big show that you directed? A network, yeah. Wow. Um, what brought you to flip coal and building? Money. <laughs> what brings you any place? John Lovton had moved there to, uh, from Ruth Riff and Ryan where he was working. Uh -huh. and, he, and Ev Mead was the client, by the way, at uh -huh. that point. George Washington Hill was the tyrant client. Well, that, that's what I want to ask you about. <laughs> and uh, we, we produced, uh, I was the executive director of the hit parade. So Producer. Your job was to be, was that what you were specifically hired to do, was to be executive director of your hit parade? Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't hard. The uh, we, Mark Warno really was responsible for the music. Mm -hmm. And the, the worst problem was when they hired Sinatra. <laughs> I'll, which I want to ask you about, but yeah. tell me, first of all, George Washington Hill was the owner of American Tobacco. American Tobacco. And his big cigarette was? Lucky Strike. And they owned 
what your lucky strike was a for for a long time and they they'd use the billboard uh, charts to determine the top musicals and but they presented the show you they presented the show the trouble was trying to find variety when you're playing the same tune 12 times in a row right on 12 weeks that was the hardest part of the show the agency wrote the copy which consisted every announcement had at least two mentions of lucky strike in it so how often would you see or meet or would you ever meet George Washington Hill? Not very often. John Lupton was welcome to that job. Occasionally I'd go along. What was he like? Well, if he wanted to make a point, for example, he'd take a silver carafe, water carafe, and throw it through the window. <laughs> that was, that was un, not uncommon. He also had bad emphysema. <laughs> Right, which is quite ironic. Yeah, it? coughing blood all the time, fortunately. What would people react when they would see him coughing blood? They wouldn't do anything. He was, he was, a, he was the boss. He paid all the bills. They wouldn't clap. <laughs> would, would he wear his hat? That's what I heard. Oh, yes, yeah, fishing hat he, with fit ties, with fly ties in it. And so he would never took that hat? Never took it off that I saw. Was he a yeller and a screamer? Oh, well, he didn't have to. He said such awful things. They spoke very loudly. Ever Mead, Everard Mead, who was in advertising yes. and later at YNR, yes. told me he thought that Hill was a bit of a fake. You know, he was an he, actor. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, he he didn't. F I know of two peop two men, good men that he really broke. Mm -hmm. One because he he came in his office and smoked another brand. He had an agency hire him, and he literally went out of his way to drive him in and sing a song when he succeeded. Mm -hmm. He recovered later. And the other person? The other person was also working for an agency, and he didn't like him. Same thing. He'd call, he'd call people in the middle of the night, for example, like this, and they'd get in a cab and drive to see a billboard in New Jersey and just stand and watch it for an hour. That was one of the ways he did it. When, when he died, I can remember Dick Compton, who had the account, who had, headed the Compton agency, called me. I was program director of WOR at that time. And he said he died and in great agony, and he'd laugh, and he was stone drunk. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have to smoke Lucky Strikes? I never smoked. I never, nor would I. But people had to, who smoked. Everard smoke said like he them. did, yeah. yeah. Pat Weaver did. He, I never seen either one of them smoke, but they smoked when they worked for him. Right, right. They had to do that. Um, 